Good morning, everyone. I'm going to call the Assembly Committee on Judiciary to order. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod? Here. Assemblywoman Cohen? Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Here. Assemblywoman Hansen? Assemblywoman Hardy? Here. Assemblywoman Kasama? Assemblywoman Krasner? Here. Assemblywoman Marzola? Here. Assemblyman Miller? Here. Assemblywoman Nguyen? Here. Assemblyman O'Neill? Here. Assemblyman Ornlicker? Here. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong? Here. Assemblyman Wheeler? Here. Chairman Yeager? Here. Please mark Assemblywoman Hansen present and Assemblywoman Kasama absent excused for the moment. I think she'll be joining us at some point, so if you could please mark her present when she arrives. That means we do have a quorum this morning. Good morning to members of the committee. Good morning to those with us here in Carson City and to those joining us on the Zoom and also to those who may be watching on the Internet or the legislature's YouTube channel. Welcome to day 87 of the 81st session of the Nevada Legislature. Before we get started on this morning's agenda, just a few housekeeping matters. For those of you joining us here in the room in Carson City, could you please silence your devices? If you're intending to testify today when you come to the table, please remember to turn the microphone on to state your name before you speak and then turn the microphone off. If you're on the Zoom with us today, please keep yourself on mute until it is time to speak. And if you could, everyone could remember to state their name each time before they speak, particularly when answering questions. That'll help our committee secretaries prepare accurate minutes. We do expect courtesy and respect in our interactions with one another. We don't always agree on policy. That's perfectly acceptable, but we need to be respectful of one another of this legislative process, and most importantly, of our very hardworking staff. And then finally, many members up here have multiple devices to access this meeting, so please don't see it as a sign of disrespect or inattention if members appear to be looking away at various points during the meeting. With those matters behind us, we'll move on to the agenda. And for now, we will take the bill, the first bill that's listed on the agenda, and that is Senate Bill 166 and its first reprint. So I will now open the hearing on that bill. It revises provisions relating to crimes motivated by certain characteristics of the victim. And again, we have Chair Scheibel here, a Senator from District 9. My Senator, welcome back to the Assembly Judiciary Committee. And when you're ready to proceed, please go ahead, and then I'm sure we'll have some questions for you when you're finished. All right, thank you so much, Chair Yeager. Um, my assembly representative, it is always a delight to be in front of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. I, we are looking at SB 166 from the first reprint, and I want to um, apologize for failing to get the sample verdict form from the Senate hearing uploaded to this meeting. Um, I realized it this morning, but I thought the easiest thing to do would be simply to direct your attention to it. When this uh, bill was heard on Monday, March 15th in the Senate Judiciary, there was an exhibit titled SB 166, Sample Verdict Form, Senator Melanie Scheibel. I will reference that in my presentation, um, and I can email it to anybody who needs it, but I hope you all know how to use Nellis at this point. Um, but if you don't, that's okay too, because I know you're learning a lot of things <laughs> in this legislative session. And uh, with that, I will go ahead and explain what SB 166 does. Um, the Senate Bill 166, and in case I didn't say it, my name is Melanie Scheibel for the record. I am the Senator from District 9. And um, as I present Senate Bill 166, which provides technical changes to the statutes regarding crimes motivated by hatred or bias, which are commonly referred to as hate crimes. Before I explain what the bill does, I want to be very clear about what the bill does not do. It does not change the definition of a hate crime, expand the classes of people protected by our hate crime statutes, or change any penalties for committing a crime motivated by hatred or bias. What Senate Bill 166 does is take two existing statutes related to hate crimes, NRS 207.185, which relates to misdemeanors, and NRS 193.1675, which relates to gross misdemeanors and felonies, and aligns the language between the two. To illustrate why this is important, I'm going to provide a realistic example, for which I've also provided a sample verdict form. The example crime is that of battery with a deadly weapon resulting in substantial bodily harm. I appreciate that many members of this committee are returning members of the judiciary. I know that you have been briefed on criminal law and the elements of criminal statutes, but I want to make sure that we're all very clear about what we're talking about. So I hope that you will forgive me if I'm repeating something that you already know and ask me questions if I am saying something that you don't understand. Because the way that the law works in Nevada and in most other states is that the crime of battery is a misdemeanor. 
A battery is defined simply as an unlawful touching of another person or the use of force against them. So a battery can be as simple as punching somebody. That would be a misdemeanor. Battery can also have other elements to it, like using a deadly weapon. So if I didn't punch somebody, but I hit them with a baseball bat, that would be battery with use of a deadly weapon. That makes it a felony crime instead of a misdemeanor crime. There can also be other attendant circumstances like substantial bodily harm. So you can take what starts out as a misdemeanor crime, a simple battery, which would be simply punching somebody with your own fists. You can, for lack of a better term, elevate it to a felony by doing it with a deadly weapon. And you can elevate it again to battery resulting in substantial bodily harm if after hitting that person with the baseball bat they are permanently disfigured, they have prolonged physical pain or suffering, or they have scars and other lasting effects from the attack. These don't have to be done together. So it is also possible, and it does happen, that we try cases for a, for a charge like battery with a deadly weapon resulting in substantial bodily harm. And the jury has to decide on all three elements. If they determine that a battery has occurred, they also have to determine whether or not substantial bodily harm occurred and whether or not the use of a deadly weapon occurred. So as you can see in the sample verdict form, there are actually a lot of options for a jury. They might find the defendant, assuming that the defendant is guilty, they might find the defendant guilty only of battery. They might find the defendant guilty of battery with substantial bodily harm. They might find the defendant guilty of battery with a deadly weapon. Or they might find the defendant guilty of battery with a deadly weapon resulting in substantial bodily harm. Those are four different guilty verdicts that the jury could return. It's important that when we create a verdict form in the state of Nevada, we do not indicate on the form which crimes are more serious than others or which ones result in higher penalties. It is against the law for a prosecutor to argue to the jury that any particular verdict will result in harsher or less harsh penalties. It is up to the judge to sentence anybody who is convicted by a jury it's only up to the jury to apply the facts of the case to the law and determine what crime was committed. So when a jury has that verdict form that includes a misdemeanor battery and three different kinds of felony batteries, the jury is not instructed on the difference between the misdemeanors and the felonies in terms of the punishment or the class of the crime. They're instructed on the difference between the facts that attend to each, but they're not instructed that one type of crime is, or one type of verdict will result in a harsher penalty than another. And put simply, they are not informed that a simple battery is a misdemeanor and all of the other verdicts other than not guilty are felonies. So it's important to recognize that if we are also going to prosecute crimes that are motivated by hatred or bias, that that gives us another possible verdict, which is guilty of any of the things that we previously discussed, battery, battery resulting in substantial bodily harm, battery with a deadly weapon, battery with a deadly weapon resulting in substantial bodily harm motivated by hatred or bias. The problem is that in our current statute, the language to describe a misdemeanor motivated by hatred or bias is different from the language to describe a felony motivated by hatred or bias, which means that we cannot simply add we cannot simply add verdicts to the verdict form that include hatred or bias because they would be defined differently. So you'd have to have separate instructions on whether the jury is going to find the defendant guilty of misdemeanor battery motivated by hatred or bias versus battery of substantial bodily harm motivated by hatred or bias, which in practice becomes very cumbersome and it doesn't make a lot of sense. That is the impetus for changing the bill to begin with, was to take the two statutes, the one that describes how a misdemeanor can be enhanced to become a gross misdemeanor based on the motivations of the defendant, and how a felony can be enhanced based on the motivations of the defendant, and bring the two statutes into alignment so that a verdict form can read like my sample verdict form with a lot of options, but they all stem from the same nucleus of oper same operative nucleus of facts. They allow for the, the jury to move cleanly between battery motivated by bias, battery substantial harm motivated by bias, 
battery with a deadly weapon motivated by bias, and so forth. There's a reason for changing the language of both statutes to reflect the misdemeanor statute instead of the felony statute. And that's that the felony statute currently says that the characteristic that the, is motivating the crime has to be different between the defendant and the victim. Um, and the reason to change the, the language to align the felony statute with the misdemeanor statute as opposed to align the misdemeanor statute with the felony statute is that in some cases, um, for example, we have seen crimes committed against someone of the same racial group who is a member of a different religious group because of their intersectional identity. The crime is clearly motivated by hatred or bias. It's also committed because a characteristic that is different from the defendant because the victim has a characteristic that is different from the defendant, but also one that is the same. For the victims of these crimes, it can be a deeply personal offense with nuance that is not easily captured in the law. I hope that we can all agree at this point that there are not simply black people and not black people and Latinx people and not Latinx people, gay people, not gay people, and Mormon people and not Mormon people. To require that the state prove the defendant and victim have actual or perceived differences in protected characteristics can be deeply upsetting to victims who see themselves as part of the same group as the defendant. This puts the prosecutor, the defense attorney, and the judge in the position, for example, this is something that I actually had to litigate. Um, it did not go to trial because it was too upsetting for the victim to litigate, whether or not somebody who is black and somebody who is half black are members of the same racial group or members of different racial groups. Because our statute required proving that they are members of different racial groups to prove that the crime was motivated by hatred or bias towards a person of a certain racial group. When the underlying facts of the crime were very clearly about the victim's race. That's section one of the bill. That is the thrust of the bill. Section two, um, is another minor cleanup. It adds two more crimes to the list of crimes that are enumerated in the um, hate crime statute. As I said at the beginning, this does not substantially expand the class of crimes or the class of people who are protected by the hate crime statute. Uh, these are simply crimes that, as far as I can tell, going through the uh, legislative history were overlooked. One of them is NRS 202.448, which is false threats of terrorism. Uh, currently, threats of terrorism can be charged as a, as a hate crime or motivated by bias, but not false threats. And 392, sorry, NRS 392.915, which is threatening to cause bodily harm or death to a pupil or school employee by means of oral, written, or electronic communication. Uh, section 3 simply adds the changes from Section 2 to the civil part of the statute. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you for the presentation, Chair Scheibel. We have a couple of questions. We're gonna start with Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Chair Giger, and thank you, Senator Scheibel, for the presentation. And I am curious, um, not curious, I am curious, and um, how you all would you, you spoke about uh, there not be having to be a difference in race or groups. Um, and you used an example of a, a crime between two black people, um, and you said that it was motivated by the difference, the intersectionality, there was a difference. Um, I'm concerned, though, that that would be considered a hate crime. Um, I, I really am, because um, there is... There are hundreds of years of, of history behind what goes on within the black community. And one of those is over prosecution and this prison pipeline that we see. And, and I am concerned that this adds another element um, that would be very hard to define. And, and I would really be very concerned that we don't have, um, you know, I have a, you know, your, your, your same example 
right? Um, and then we are now enhancing what could be simple battery, right, an argument. Um, there are so many nuances to the black experience. I just am concerned that we don't need another reason to incarcerate people and then add onto already existing carceral system. And if you could please give me more context because this is very worrying to me. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Melanie Scheibel of Senate District 9 for the record. And uh, the particular case that I am talking about, um, what I, I want to be clear that um, this approach is victim centered, and that is where the that is where the proposed change in the law comes from, because the particular victim in this case was half black, and he was targeted by other black students because he was half black, and they made racially motivated comments towards him, and they harassed him and um, they threatened violence against him because he wasn't, quote, black enough. As a white prosecutor, um, I chose to follow the victim's lead and to ask the victim whether or not they thought this was a racially motivated crime. And the victim was insistent that it was. This victim felt that they had been targeted because of their race. And I was in a very uncomfortable position, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with white prosecutors being uncomfortable. But I was in the position of having a victim who felt that they were targeted because of their race. And the only way that I could prove it under the law that they were the victim of a hate crime was to prove that the victim was of a different race from the defendant. And that also didn't seem right. It doesn't seem right to me, and it also wasn't right to the victim. Uh, it put everybody in a place where the law didn't make sense. I'll also point out that Nevada is the only state in the entire country that has a clause in its statute on hatred motivated crimes that includes that they have to be different characteristics between the victim and the perpetrator. And um, I have not seen a case where having that distinction um, is valuable in actually proving the, the motivation of the perpetrator. Chair, follow up, please. please go I guess this is where, and I, I understand what you're saying, and I know that there are other precedents in other states and all of that, but as a black woman who has been teased because I speak in a certain manner and, and was accused that that wasn't black enough, um, that I uh, have hobbies um, coming, f coming up as a child that may not have been black enough for some people. This is a very difficult issue uh, within our race of people, and it is, um, it is very concerning. And I am not certain, just personally, um, that this is the way. And, and I think that it, it leaves so much objectivity. Um, even, we don't even know like what the victim's background is, whether they have, um, you know, what their family story is. We are not a monolithic people. And I'm just concerned that this could go way south, especially when we're talking about kids, especially young people who are all trying to find their identity and figure out who they are, that have all kinds of outside pressures. And I'm not saying that kids should be fighting and teasing one another in this manner, but to enhance, a, to enhance what could be a schoolyard argument because people have a disagreement. You have no, there's, we could talk all day, Senator, about this whole thing, it is so deep. I'm really concerned that you could tell a kid who's 16 or 15 years old that they called somebody a, a name on the, on the schoolyard and then that kid end up uh, with an enhancement because the other kid happened to be biracial. Um, this is very concerning to me. So, and I think that it needs, um, 
some more nuance to what you've written here in the law. Um, and I think it needs to be extremely cautiously applied when we're talking about minors, because this is where most of this foolishness happens, and that is in school. And, we, and it, to me, we cannot take a 15-year-old kid who teased another and make this a felony or a gross misdemeanor, and then here they are in the carcinal system because they're beefing on the schoolyard. It's, it's very disturbing. Thank you. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, and um, I, I appreciate your comment, and I want to point out that the purpose of this statute is to address hatred-motivated crimes. It's not about um, the objective or the naked facts of a case. Um, proving a hate enhancement is difficult, um, and it requires a clear showing that the defendant was motivated by hatred or bias, not just that they displayed hatred or bias, but that the victim who they attacked or the victim who they targeted was targeted because they are a member of a protected class. I also agree with you that this is incredibly nuanced, and that's why um, I, am, I believe it is important that we remove the necessity for a distinction between the victim and the perpetrator because it puts the law, it puts the court in the position of being the arbiter of whether or not people belong to the same racial group, whether or not they belong to the same religious group, whether or not they belong to the same part of the LGBTQ community. And I don't think that it's the place of a court, the place of a judge, the place of a prosecutor to tell people whether or not they have the same characteristics. Um, our law, our legislature has already decided to pass a hate crime statute. That horse has left the stable. So if we're going to be prosecuting people and enhancing the penalties because the crimes were motivated by hatred or bias, I believe that we should be focusing on the behavior, we should be focusing on the motivation, we should be focusing on all the facts and circumstances that tell us that somebody's criminal activity was motivated by the characteristics of the victim and not focused on the complex identities of the people involved. Okay, do we have further questions from committee members? Let me take a look. Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for the presentation, Senator. And I'm sorry, I had to run upstairs and grab my notes, um, so I, I missed about two minutes of it um, or less. But I, I want to make sure I understand this. So are you saying if two kids or young adults or even adults are, are fighting and someone uses a racial slur during the fight, that wouldn't meet the standard, but that, but that you, through the investigation, maybe find text messages that were um, clearly racially motivated or, or something like that. Like what's the, I guess for those of us who don't practice criminal law, can you tell us what kind of evidence we'd be looking at and how, how a prosecutor would make that case? Yes, thank you. Uh, Melanie Scheibel, for the record. Um, let me start by saying that I think I am the only prosecutor in the state who's taken a hate crime to trial. Um, if there are others, I would encourage them to reach out to me because it was very difficult and I lost. Um, it is not easy to prove um, an enhancement for motivation by of bias or hatred. So the kinds of things that we look at, um, like to your example, it would not be a statement made you know, one statement, one slur, one epithet in the course of criminal conduct. Um, it probably wouldn't even be a single text message or um, a single Facebook post. It would be things like um, there was a crime committed many years ago um, against some members of the Muslim community who were targeted as they were leaving church, um, and it was they were beaten within an inch of their lives with a baseball bat, and um, the individual who committed the crime said at the time that that was the reason that he had targeted those people. Um, and those are the kinds of 
pieces of evidence that we utilize to determine whether or not something is motivated by hatred or bias. Like I said, it is a, it's a difficult bar to clear and it is up to a jury. A, um, I mean, unless we're talking about um, a, some kind of negotiation, but that, that question of hatred or bias is up to the jury. So a, a jury of 12 has to determine whether or not the evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt that the motivation for the crime was that person's gender identity, religious affiliation, race, sex, ethnicity. Um, and it, there, and it also has to clear a bar of probable cause before it even gets to the jury trial. So I've also had numerous um, enhancements dismissed before a jury trial because a judge determines that there's not even probable cause for one. Thank you. We'll go next to Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Chair. Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. Um, thank you so much, Senator, for bringing this bill. I also don't practice criminal law, so I just wanted to go more into um, what you were saying. Like, so it's very difficult to prove an enhancement for a hate crime, is what you're saying. And so, how would this bill uh, hurt or or advance being able to prosecute a hate crime? When I think you just went into it a little bit, how difficult it is. So, can you just walk us through that a little bit more, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, and um, again, this bill doesn't change the fact that we have a hate crime statute and that we're prosecuting hate crimes, but um, it eliminates, I don't, to me, and I know that people disagree, to me, this doesn't make it easier or harder to prove a hate crime enhancement. What this does is it eliminates this one particular question that has to be answered. And that question that no longer has to be answered is, do the victim and the defendant share the characteristic or are they different? Um, another thing that it does is it prevents, so, oh, it, um, it, how do I put this? I'll give you another example <laughs> about that. Um, I had a, another case, um, I don't, and, I had another case of a crime committed against somebody because of their sexual orientation. And um, the defense attorney said to me, well, what if my client just says that he's also gay? And we both kind of looked at each other and said, well, technically then the law wouldn't apply because based on the law, I'd have to prove that his client wasn't gay and committed a crime against the victim because the victim was gay. And um, that just didn't make sense to me. Um, and so what we're doing is eliminating that question because, um, and again, I don't think that makes it easier or harder. If I had gone to trial on that case and we had litigated whether both parties were gay or one party was gay, um, I think it would have been just as difficult to prove whether or not that was the case, but I don't see the value in doing that. Thank you so much, um, Cecilia G Gonzalez, District 16, for the record. Do you see a lot of these cases in your professional career? Like, is this something that happens often? Thank you. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, no, I do not see them often. Um, I think I have seen more of them than most prosecutors because I take them on. Um, but we do not, I, I would not say that they are common. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do we have further questions from committee members? Okay, looking to the right, I don't see anyone with a question. Looking to the left, I don't see anyone with a question there. Chair Scheibel, thank you for your presentation. We'll ask you to hold tight for a moment. We'll take testimony on the bill and then have a chance for concluding remarks. At this time, I'm gonna open it up for testimony in support of Senate Bill 166 and its first reprint. Is there anyone with us here in Carson City who would like to testify in support? I don't see anyone coming forward here in Carson City. I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom with us, but I'm gonna take a quick look over at the screen and see if anyone is turning their camera on. All I see is myself in a small <laughs> bubble, so I think we don't have anyone on the Zoom. BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there's anybody there who'd like to testify in support, please? 
Good morning. Thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 166, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. For callers wishing to provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 166, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. We will begin with caller with the last three digits of 648. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair Yeager, members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is John Jones, J-O-H-N-J-O-N-E-S, here on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association in support of SB 166. And we want to thank uh, Chair Scheibel uh, for bringing the bill. Essentially, this bill just aligns the definition of hate crimes that are contained in both 193-1675 and 207-185. Um, and I think the, the reasons for aligning the definitions that were talked about during the testimony and support um, are clear. There were some discussions about uh, juveniles and schoolyard fights uh, that were brought out during um, the questioning. And I want to be clear that in juvenile courts, there are not flat sentences that would be enhanced by a hate crime. However, juvenile courts do have case plans with youth and families that are designed to address the issues that brought the trial to the juvenile court. The case plans are tied to the charges that brought the, um, the child in the court. And by acknowledging that a delinquent act was motivated by hatred or bias, the juvenile court may take additional steps to address that bias and give victims the acknowledgement they deserve. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are uh, in support of SB 166, and I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Jones. BPS, do we have additional callers in support? Yes, Chair. We will take caller two. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Chuck Calloway, C-A-L-L-A-W-A-Y, representing the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. And we're in uh, support of the bill and wanted the record to reflect that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Calloway. BPS, could we take the next caller, please? Chair, there are no other callers in support. Thank you, BPS. I'll close testimony in support. I will now open it up for testimony in opposition. Is there anyone here in Carson City who would like to testify in opposition? Welcome, Mr. Pirro. I think this is your first time appearing in person in front of the committee. We certainly heard from you quite a bit on the phone. So uh, welcome to in-person Assembly Judiciary, and please go ahead. Good morning, Chairman Yeager and members of the committee. This is John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. Uh, it is nice to be here in person. I'd like to first start by acknowledging the problems with hate crimes and the recent uptick in hate crimes. It is a problem, and I'd like to thank Senator Scheibel for trying to address the problem. There's a couple of issues that we have here. Nevada statute is perhaps out of line, but it probably needs to be rebuilt from the ground up rather than the way it's being rebuilt now. Uh, part of the, our statute ignores some of the federal guardrails in place. Also, some of the penalties in the federal system are less than the penalties that we have here in Nevada. So perhaps we need to reevaluate our statute from the ground up and take it from there so that we have a more comprehensive statute. Part of our concern is the same concern that was brought about by Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. We are concerned about two people fighting and using a pejorative term in the middle of the fight and a prosecutor taking that and using that as an opportunity to enhance penalties. And that enhancement comes at the charging phase. And charging a more steep penalty should not be used as a negotiation tool, but sometimes it often is. More so, prosecutors should not uh, be able to get out of having to prove certain aspects of an enhancement. When you charge a crime that has the enhancement of a victim over 60, you have to prove that the victim is indeed over 60. So if we're going to uh, charge a hate crime, you have to prove that the conduct was motivated by the hate. This attack on this person would not have happened but for that differing characteristic. Uh, and I'm looking over at Assemblyman Oren Lichter because he is at the law school that I go to, which is one of the top writing programs. And a word that we use when writing our exams is the word because. The attack happened because, but for. It would not have happened if the person was a a differing characteristic. So those are things that are 
important. Um, so I think it is time for a possible change, but I think maybe we should start from the ground up, run it through the sentencing commission, come to a point where we can all figure out how we align with everybody else in the United States and the feds, including penalties and how we do this so that all people in our community are protected in a way that makes sense and it's not abused by, by some prosecutors. And I'm not saying Senator Scheibel is the type of prosecutor to abuse something like this, but there are prosecutors in this state that I could see charging this in a way to harm a member of a community because a pejorative term was used, not because the attack happened because of that characteristic. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Pirro. Is there anybody else here in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition? Ms. Brown, welcome, and please proceed. Tanya Brown, advocates for the inmates and the innocent. We oppose this bill. We believe it should, this bill should start from the ground up. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Brown. Anybody else here in Carson City? I don't see anyone coming to the table. Let me check the Zoom. If there's anyone there, if you'd please turn your camera on. Again, I just see a smaller version of myself, which is weird. Uh, BPS, could we go to the phone lines, please, and see if there's anybody else, anybody there in opposition? Thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 166, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. We will begin with the caller with the last three digits of 080. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, Jim Hoffman, representing Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice. NACJ opposes SB 166. We agree with the concerns raised by Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong and Cohen with Mr. Pirro. In addition, while we appreciate Senator Scheibel's intent to keep the definition of hate crime the same, we do not believe the bill as drafted accomplishes that. Section one of the bill changes the causal standard for what constitutes a hate crime. Under existing law, a hate crime is a crime that happens because of protected characteristics such as race. But the bill changes this language to by reason of a protected characteristic. Because of is a legal term of art which has been well defined through case law. Because of is also used in the federal statute, 18 U.S.C. 249. It means that the characteristic must be a but for cause of the crime. But for the person's race, they wouldn't have been attacked. This is an unambiguous legal definition that tracks with the common sense understanding of what a hate crime is and keeps Nevada aligned with the federal statute. By contrast, by reason of is unclear and not well defined. So it would require a lot of litigation to determine what is actually covered. But the implication to my understanding is that it's a much lower and more attenuated standard of causation because people can have lots of reasons that play a small part in what they do, and any of those would be grounds for prosecution under the bill. To illustrate the difference, think about a thief whose MO is to grab people's purses off their shoulders. Their overwhelming motivation is just to steal money, and purses are a much easier target to grab and run away with as opposed to wallets, which are tucked away in someone's pocket. This person targets mainly women because it's mainly women who carry purses. It's not because they're a misogynist who hates women. It's just about purses being easier to grab. This is not something that we would consider a hate crime. And under Nevada's current statute, which is also the federal statute, it could not be charged as a hate crime. But under the new definition in the bill, it could be charged as a hate crime because gender is a reason behind which people carry purses, behind which people carry purses, sorry, and so it qualifies under the new standard in the bill. So the bill is currently drafted would make it so that every purse snatcher could be charged with a hate crime. And that's just one example. There are lots of other scenarios, such as the schoolyard fight that the assembly people mentioned, where a lower standard would dramatically expand criminal liability. We don't believe this reflects the common sense understanding of hate crimes, and we don't believe this is good public policy. So ultimately, uh, we don't believe that the bill as it's currently drafted does a good job of preventing or punishing hate crimes. It would just introduce a lot of complexity, extra litigation, and ultimately result in people being prosecuted for hate crimes who shouldn't be. So we oppose it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Hoffman. BPS, is there anybody else on the line in opposition, please? 
If you have recently joined the call and would like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 166, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. For callers wishing to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 166, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no other callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, BPS. I will close opposition testimony. I will now open it up for neutral testimony. Anybody in the room with us in Carson City who'd like to testify in the neutral position? I don't see anybody coming to the table. Let me check the Zoom. I don't see anyone turning a camera on there. BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there's any neutral testimony, please? Thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to testify in neutral of Senate Bill 166, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Callers wishing to provide testimony in neutral of Senate Bill 166, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you, BPS. I will close neutral testimony. I'll invite Chair Scheibel back to the table for any concluding remarks on Senate Bill 166. Thank you so much, Chair Yeager, and thank you to the committee for your, your time and attention and for engaging in this conversation with me. I want to uh, make a couple of you know closing comments. The first is that I would be happy to rebuild the statute from the ground up. Um, if that is something that Nevadans want and that Nevadans feel they need, I would be uh, happy to sit at the table and redraft the entire um, statute about crimes motivated by hatred. Um, I did not do that <laughs> coming into today's hearing. Um, what I did is make a small change to align two statutes with each other. Um, I think that the Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice called in with an interesting um, concern regarding the use of the term by reason of instead of because of. Um, and that language simply comes from the Nevada Revised Statutes. I have researched the history of both of these statutes quite thoroughly to try to determine why they were ever different to begin with, why, they, why the language was different, and I cannot find any reason, um, which is a long way of saying that I would be happy to amend the bill to utilize the term because of instead of by reason of. Um, it's not a term that I've ever litigated, but if that is um, important to people who practice in this area, and if that is important to people who are affected by this bill, then I am happy to make that adjustment to the bill. The purpose, I want to again be very clear, is to bring the statutes into alignment so that whether you are being charged with a misdemeanor, a gross misdemeanor, or a felony, the elements that have to be met to prove an enhancement for motivation by hatred or bias are exactly that, an enhancement motivated by hatred or bias. It's not about um, proving anybody's identity. It's about proving that the crime was committed because of somebody else's identity. And um, as always, I'm happy to continue to further discuss this with any members of the committee or anybody who called in um, and make those amendments to the bill. And I hope that we can get to a consensus. Thank you so much, Chair Scheibel. I'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 166 in its first reprint. And Chair Scheibel, if you could stay at the table, because we'll take your next bill next on the agenda. So committee members, we're going to go to the third bill that's listed on the agenda. I will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 332 in its first reprint. That bill revises provisions relating to structured settlements. As you can see, we have Chair Scheibel again joining us, and I believe we have Mr. Alonzo in the room and perhaps some others on the Zoom as well. So Chair Scheibel, uh, the floor is yours, and go ahead and take us through uh, Senate Bill 332, please. Thank you so much, Chair Yeager. For the record, my name is still Melanie Scheibel and I represent Senate District 9. And SB 332 um, is a bill about structured settlements, which I learned about in order to bring this bill forward. And so Mr. Alonzo will walk you through the bill and he can provide some more detail and clarity on the policy. But I just wanna give you a very broad overview. Um, what a structured settlement is, um, 
occurs in a civil case when one person has sued another and they have won a judgment against them. And so, um, for example, if I am the person who has won a structured settlement, I might be awarded $50,000 by being, but the structure of the settlement is to award me $10,000 each year for five years. Um, there are some companies, there are about three, I believe was the number I last heard in Nevada, that will purchase these structured settlements in order to provide the recipient of the settlement with more money sooner. So if I'm looking at $10,000 a year for five years, a company may offer me $20,000 this year um, in order to buy the settlement from me so then they would profit the additional $30,000, but I would get the $20,000 today instead of having to wait another year. Um, as you can probably imagine, certainly my mind went to um, unscrupulous actors who would want to exploit people who are in need of additional funds sooner, and the purpose of this bill is to avoid that. Uh, we don't know that that is happening in Nevada, but we also do not require any kind of registration for these companies that buy structured settlements. So what SB 332 does is it requires those companies to register with the Department of Business and Industry so that we are aware of their practice in Nevada, and um, it allows us to build the framework moving forward to ensure that Nevadans are not being preyed upon by bad actors in this space um, who, who may come out of the woodworks in the future. And uh, with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Mr. Alonzo to uh, better explain it. Thank you, Chair Scheibel. Mr. Alonzo, welcome to Assembly Judiciary. And we'll give you some time to take us through the bill, and then we'll see if we have some questions. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, Alfredo Alonzo with the law firm of Lewis and Roca. Uh, today on behalf of the National Association of Settlement uh, Purchasers. And uh, on, uh, on Zoom, I have uh, uh, Jack Kelly, who's counsel for the association, and Brian Deere, who is the executive director. And they will actually walk you through the bill. Uh, um, unfortunately for me, I, I if I studied up for the next 10 years, I don't think I'd understand settlement, uh, structure settlements as well as uh, Mr. Kelly does. Uh, so I, I'll turn it over to them. I, I just want to start with uh, uh, this is an area that's, that's uh, uh, quite complicated, um, uh, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Kelly can answer many of your questions, but uh, the language is a model language that NCOIL put together and that's the National Council of Insurance Legislators, which they do that on a, on a fairly regular basis to update uh, uh, such language throughout the country. And, uh, and so what you have before you is essentially their model act. Uh, and again, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Alonzo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, and uh, thank you, Senator Schneibel, for your sponsorship of this legislation. My name is Jack Kelly. I'm appearing on behalf of the National Association of Settlement Purchasers. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief background on, on structured settlements so they have an underlying history of it. In the late 1970s and mid 1970s, uh, while I was a, a staff member of the House Ways and Means Committee in Congress, uh, we established a uh, law which allowed for uh, the creation of a structured settlement uh, on a tax-free basis uh, for the purposes of addressing long-term care uh, for individuals that were involved in the need for long-term care. It, uh, it came out of the need for long-term care specifically related to uh, issues such as the Malahide babies. As the years went on and in the 1980s and 90s, uh, the structured settlement system, which Congress had intended at that point for these long-term care situations, uh, became to be used for different purposes. And it then became used to settle uh, issues as simple as a slip and fall, or could be, uh, could be arranged a structured settlement for a child uh, who lost a parent uh, in a car accident to care for them during their minority years uh, and then provide them monies, which is a valid use and the purpose of what the law was written for. But because it had changed and been used for other purposes, in the 1990s, the cottage industry emerged where individuals and companies 
uh, would offer to buy portions of structured settlements that were not being needed or used by individuals. Uh, uh, if you had a child who is now 30 years old, who is receiving uh, $30,000 a year for, for his care, he may want to go uh, uh, get a graduate degree. He might want to go to vocational school. He might want to buy uh, a business that he wants to get into. So he doesn't need the money or she doesn't need the money for their care anymore. So they may want to sell a portion of that uh, to one of these companies. Uh, as a result of it, uh, Congress examined this issue and said it had merit, that there was a reason that people would want to at future times want to sell a portion of their structured settlement. But they had one requirement in order to do this. So in 2002, when Congress created the 9-11 Victims Bill, the Victims Bill was a very large structured settlement for the people who were horrifically, uh, families were horrific loss at 9-11, at, at and they created a structured settlement for those individuals, and included in that legislation was language to address the other types of structured settlements. And what it basically said was this, is that Congress will allow you to have one of these structured settlements transferred, provided you go to a court of general jurisdiction and a judge reviews the case and determines that the individuals, it is in the individual's best interest to make the transfer or the payment, but they must also consider the health and welfare of their dependents. Shortly after that law was enacted, Nevada being a cutting edge state at the point adopted what they viewed to be the transfer system that you have today. In 2004, the National Conference of Insurance Legislators uh, met and adopted a uniform act and a model act that's used across the United States. Uh, since that time, Nevada's law has not been adjusted to address the end coil changes. Uh, before you today is uh, legislation that would bring it up to uh, uh, the end coil model and includes in it two additional updates that were adopted by the uh, Louisiana's uh, who had the president of NCOIL and then Georgia recently. Those changes provide for a robust consumer disclosures, uh, a disclosure of the effective annual rate. It precludes forum shopping, which is very important for consumer protection. An individual in Henderson could not go to Reno and seek a, a transfer order up in Reno. They would have to go in their home county in, where they live to seek it so that a local judge reviews it and a, is aware of the individual being before their court. Uh, it also requires that a registration of the company. This is very important. Right now, Nevada does not know who does business in their state doing these transactions. The only people who are aware of it are the courts. So if someone had a complaint, if there was a bad apple, there really is nowhere to look for a registration. This registration requires that bonding be filed. It requires to see the financial suitability of the enterprise. These are critical to protect the citizens of Nevada. And what it also does is it impedes bad behavior by, by untowards actors and bad apples who come in and sometimes will do what's called poaching. They will go into a courthouse and they will look at the records of the cases that are filed. They'll get the name of an individual who is seeking a transfer or purchase of a structured settlement. They will call them up and they will fraudulently say they may be the actual company that they're dealing with and say, don't show up at the courthouse. We're moving your case to another month. We're going to send you $250 and we'll refile the case and it'll be structured better for you. And they'll abuse that person. Under the provisions here, that behavior will be eliminated. Nevada would be one of the, the front uh, four or five states that's initiated this. Uh, it's important. But what it also does is it has bright line disclosures that say that a consumer needs to seek advice in doing this transaction so that they know just what they're getting into. Uh, this is a good law. This is a law that is, is as this, the law says, it's a protection act. And people in Nevada have to have the right to have these done as the federal law allows, but at the same time, they need to be protected. I'm happy to answer any members of the committee's question. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, uh, Brian Deere, uh, who is the executive director of the National Association of Settlement Purchasers, but who is also an attorney in, uh, in Texas 
who uh, performs and represents individuals in such transfers of these. So he's uh, intimately familiar. This is a civil procedure law that protects citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Alonzo. And thank you, Mr. Deere, for being here for questions as well. It looks like we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to start first with Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you all for the presentation. And, and if uh, Senator Scheibel watches this later, thank you for bringing this legislation because I, I do think it's important. Um, and and I really appreciate the, um, the disclosure section. Um, there's a couple of questions I have. Um, the first one, uh, I guess we'll just make it the easy one. Of course, now I can't find it. Um, so just, I, I guess, more a point in, in Section 30, Sub 4, uh, about the um, child support and making sure that the public agency enforcing the order um, is notified. Um, I just want to make the point that sometimes orders aren't enforced by an agency. So if, if there's a way we could address that and say if there's, if it's owed that it's, that there's notification or maybe it's somewhere else in there, but, um, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, that actually, the, the court. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Kelly, required. could you just please state your name for the record before you answer the question? I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and members of the committee. Uh, Jack Kelly for uh, the National Association of Settlement Purchases. Assemblywoman, an excellent point. Uh, the court actually has to, and the order that's submitted, which is submitted under oath, uh, has to be submitted by counsel, stating that, it, it, that there are no obligations or orders expected with that. And under the federal law, it requires that the court review uh, the health and welfare of the dependents, not just if there's child support owed, but if there's child support that uh, that is even more necessary, that that it could impede it. Uh, if the order does not include those two findings, it would be violative of the federal statute. And then an imposition of a 40 percent excise tax on the company that purchases it. So the company would not place themselves at such risk. So their due diligence on that is extremely significant uh, in making sure that child support is, uh, is adhered to. And and so, um, and you mentioned the, the company's due diligence, but if they, so are you saying that goes beyond just asking the client, hey, do you owe any child support? Yes, it's, uh, it's required. Uh, I will tell you that there is an extensive search done uh, by, the, uh, by the company purchasing this uh, to ensure there are no outstanding orders. Uh, the risk, very frankly, uh, some even, that's why Congress did it this way. Uh, you know that in corporate America, the risk that the that is the greatest risk is the penalty of tax. Uh, that's why we call them excise tax. When we where one of the things I learned at Ways and Means was if you want to uh, curb an industry's bad behavior, put an excise tax on them. Uh, if you would lose 40 percent in this transaction by having to pay such a tax, the transaction would be financially upside down and they'd actually lose money. So there's no no company would ever dream of taking that risk. It's just too great. Thank you. And then, um, so my other question um, is in section 38 sub one, and this is something that Mr. Alonzo and I discussed yesterday, and I believe he, he contacted you as well, Mr. Kelly. Um, but it's, it's the line about the court making a finding um, that the transfer is in the best interest of the payee. Um, you know, that just sounds so paternalistic to me. Um, you know, we have a right to make bad contracts. And even though these, right. you know, as long as they're not unconscionable, we have the right to do that. And 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 I understand that you had said this was based on, on federal law, but it, 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 why is this different than any other bad contract I have the right to go out and make? That, that's an excellent point, Assemblywoman. This is Jack Kelly for the National Association of Settlement Purchasers. Um, it is interesting that you raised that. When I worked on this legislation, uh, I had once in my lifetime worked in the family court. So I had uh, was very cognizant of the different standards that courts would look at, particularly in preponderance or clear and concise. But uh, Congress used the best interest standard just for that exact reason. 
And the reason being that the courts have held over a period of time that these are the assets of an individual, that the person owns this asset and they have the right to do with this asset as they wish. Uh, and what the what Congress was saying, all we want to do is make sure that if this were structured in such a way that that's why they put the health and welfare standards in for the dependents, that while it's your asset, you just can't willy nilly throw it away uh, if it would damage your dependents and you and your children. And, and that's why it was set up as a best interest, not as a preponderance not as a clear and concise. That was why that standard was put in by Congress and implemented in the law. And it's an excellent question and very and very forthright. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And I guess I'm 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 still somewhat confused because I, again, I I could make a contract. I could have a business that's doing gangbusters and I decide I, I'm not worried about feeding my children. I'm not worried about feeding my spouse. I'm just going to sell my business for $50 and, and we'll live I, off the land. And there's nothing a court can do about that. Um, and also, I mean, it, it, the language itself says the best interest of the payee. So it's express findings in the paragraph above, but then it says that the transfer is in the best interest of the payee taking into account the welfare and support of the payee's dependents, but it's still talking about the payee. Uh, um, Chairman, uh, this is Jack Kelly, National Association of Settlement Purchases. Uh, I, I, I do agree with what you're saying in a sense, but you have to understand, structured settlements are not a traditional contract in the sense that it's just between two parties uh, uh, that entered into it. It is a doctrine that is established under tax law because the creation of this structure, this, this transaction is a structured settlement under tax law, which allows for the tax-free inside buildup of the assets and the annuity associated with it. Unlike just a tr traditional transfer between two people. Uh, Congress, you asked, why does Congress get involved in this? This is a tax underlying tax transaction, uh, the structured settlement creation itself. And the reason that Congress created that transaction, the public policy that created it, was to provide for the long-term care of people. And it began to be used for other purposes. That was when Congress allowed for this transaction. What they were saying, the best interest, was just to make sure that this isn't a thamaldehyde baby case. This isn't an individual who has to have long-term care for medical treatment. That's why they established the, the ability to be able to make the transfer. They recognized just what you were saying. And that's why they made the standards so uh, different than other standards and made it best interest. I rarely have seen, and Mr. Uh, Deere can speak to this, having, having his done n numerous transactions representing people. Courts of general jurisdiction very rarely uh, will uh, choose uh, to look at an, an individual and say, I don't think you should spend your money this way. They will only usually look at it if the person says, I need to have a, an iron lung and I can't afford it if I get rid of this money. Uh, that's the purpose of the best interest standard. And you can't have another standard other than that. It's, a, it's, it's already an existing uh, Nevada law. Thank you. I, 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 don't, I guess I'm still finding it somewhat vague and just concerned that you could have an overzealous judge who just says, I don't like this product. I'm not going to sign off on this. And, and so I would hope that maybe we could come up with something that's a little more closer to what you're, you're saying and, and where. Um, yeah, I, I understand. But the challenge, the challenge, Assemblywoman, is that it would violate federal, the federal requirement if we deviated from that. Okay, thank you. That, I mean, the problem is Section 5891 of the Internal Revenue Code requires that exact statutory language. That language out of the entire bill is the only one that statutorily must be adhered to. It cannot be deviated from without deviating, without changing the federal law. That 50 states in the United States have this exact same language and have had it since 2003, including Nevada. 
Okay. Well, I, I, again, I mean, I guess I would just, I, I think you can have the language and still be a little more clarifying in what that, in, in what it means and, and what it doesn't, but I'll, I'll talk to our council about that. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a question next from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Alonzo. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Alonzo, Mr. Kelly, for the presentation. My question is about the bonding. Um, I see that it's $50,000 for the bonding uh, and the surety. Um, why not a million, which is often seen in, co in contracts? Seems a little low, and it seems to open up the door for moderately bad players because it's, it doesn't exclude um, them from participating in this. Uh, uh, Jack Kelly for the National Association of Settlement Purchases. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman, I appreciate the question. Uh, in the case of a million dollar bond and all, that would be a case where the bond would be used uh, to cover losses that an individual may have. That's traditionally how bonds are used uh, by a state agency. Uh, in this case, uh, the reasoning for it is to preclude bad apples because they can't get bonds. Uh, there's no, uh, once a person's money is transferred and then uh, the, uh, the annuity is purchased uh, and they receive their money from uh, the structured settlement purchaser at the right after the courthouse transaction, uh, the, cons the recipient is whole. They've got all their money. There's, there, there's no harm, no foul. They don't have to, at a future date, turn to a, uh, to a state agency and say, uh, would you, uh, uh, we, got, uh, we were misled, we didn't, uh, we didn't get the money we were promised, we need you to pay the money out of the bond. Uh, that doesn't happen because the money's transferred through a court order, it has to be done. The 50,000 purpose is, it, it, it is intended when the states adopted this, bad apples won't spend the money to get a bond. Uh, a, first of all, in many cases, bad apples can't get a bond. Uh, second case, they won't be able to get the financial accruity that they would have to demonstrate. And uh, it has been proven to be enough of a barrier from these two people in a cell phone in the back of a car trying to set up a business that they won't even try it. They just say, I don't want to be with, I don't want the courts, I don't want the state to know who I am. So that's how, it, that's how it's been successful, uh, Madam uh, Assemblyman. Uh, chair, follow up, please. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, does this open the door for insurance companies to participate in this business, or is this going to be separate? Um, because we've seen insurance companies get into all different other lines of business, which has been concerning over the years. So does this law preclude them or would this open the door for them to also not only offer insurance but also off, offer these services as well uh it would be difficult under the tax code for them to do it because they create the structured settlement uh and they would then be violating the doctrine of constructed receipt and other issues uh and they could be viewed uh, as damaging their tax structures so they they would pref they would avoid doing it Thank it was you. the insurance companies actually that it was the insurance companies that acted one of the supporters of getting this law passed so that they wouldn't be misconstrued as being in the business. Thank you. Do we have further questions from committee members? Okay, I'm gonna ask just one because we're in Nevada and I think I'm obligated to ask this question. So when we think about um, structured settlements, uh, what comes to mind and I understand the bill applies to uh, settlements relating to tort or workers' comp, but of course, here in the state, we have uh, slot machines that pay out jackpots like megabucks, and when you look at the front of the machine, it says if you win this jackpot, you're going to get an annual payment over the course of 20 years, and I assume that this kind of concept does not apply to that because that is not a tax transaction that is set up by Congress. That's just something separate that uh, our casino properties might choose to do so they don't have to pay out a giant lump sum at the winning of a jackpot. So if you could just confirm that those are apples and oranges, which is why we have what we have here in uh, Senate Bill 332, please. Uh, Jack Kelly appearing for the National Association of Settlement Purchases. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, this only applies to uh, structures created under 5891 of the Internal Revenue Code or Section 130 that originally created the structured settlements. 
uh, for tort actions. It doesn't apply to gaming winnings or lotteries or anything like that. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Appreciate that clarification. Uh, committee members, again, last call for questions. Okay, I don't see questions at this time, so I want to thank the three of you for presenting. What we'll do is have you sit tight. We'll take some testimony on the bill if there is any, and then we'll come back for concluding remarks. And uh, just so everybody knows, I did uh, advise Senator Scheibel that she was free to go to her morning committee, and it looks like she has left the bill in very capable hands here in the room. So at this time, I'm going to open it up for testimony in support of Senate Bill 332, and we're going to start here in Carson City. Would anyone like to testify in support? of Senate Bill 332. I don't see anybody coming forward. I don't believe we have anyone else on the Zoom other than our presenters. BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there's anybody there in support? Thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 332, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. For callers wishing to provide testimony for Senate Bill 332, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers on the line in support at this time. Thank you, BPS. I'll close testimony in support. I will now open it for testimony in opposition. Is there anybody here in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition? Looks like everyone is busy on other matters here in Carson City. I don't see anyone on the Zoom in opposition. BPS, could we please check the phone lines to see if there's anybody there in opposition? Thank you. For callers wishing to provide testimony for Senate Bill 332 in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Callers wishing to provide testimony in opposition of Senate Bill 332, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers on the line for opposition at this time. Thank you, BPS. I'll close opposition testimony. I'm now open neutral testimony. Anybody in Carson City in the neutral position? Don't see anybody coming forward. Again, I don't believe we have anybody on the Zoom in the neutral position. BPS, could we check the phone lines to see if there's any neutral testimony, please? Yes, Chair. For callers wishing to provide testimony in neutral of Senate Bill 332, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. For callers wishing to provide testimony in neutral of Senate Bill 332, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you, BPS. I will close neutral testimony. We'll now go to concluding remarks for Senate Bill 332. And again, Chair Scheibel has left those concluding remarks to Mr. Alonzo and Mr. Kelly. So Mr. Alonzo, we'll start with you here for concluding remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, Alfredo Alonzo with the law firm of Lewis and Roca. Uh, I simply want to thank the Senator for uh, uh, putting forth the bill and uh, the chair and the committee's indulgence. Uh, uh, if anyone has any questions after the fact, we'd be glad to answer any we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alonzo. Mr. Kelly, would you like to make any concluding remarks? I'd just like to, uh, this is Jack Kelly from the National Association of Settlement Purchasers. On behalf of the association, our members, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee for taking the time to listen to us today, and to Senator Schneibel for uh, uh, advancing this legislation. It's a good bill that really will protect the people of Nevada, and, uh, and it's wanted and needed. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Alonzo, and thank you, Mr. Deer, for being here as well for questions. We appreciate you spending some time with us, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So at this time, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 332, and that takes us to the second bill as listed on the agenda. I will now open the hearing on Senate Bill 203 and its first reprint. Senate Bill 203 and its first reprint revises provisions relating to civil actions involving certain sexual offenses. We have Senator Don Darrow Loop joining us here today in the room. We have Ms. Brazier joining us on the Zoom. Uh, welcome and good morning to both of you. Before I hand it over, I will let committee members and members of the public know there is uh, one amendment to the bill that 
is posted on Nellis, so if you haven't had a chance to look at that yet, uh, please do pull that up. I'm sure it will be discussed in the presentation. Uh, but again, uh, welcome, Senator, and please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Yeager. It's a pleasure to be back in a room that I spent several uh, sessions in, so thank you very much. For the record, I am Marilyn Dondero Loop, representing Senate District 8 in Clark County, and with me today I have Allison Brazier, an attorney in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm pleased to present Senate Bill 203 for your consideration today. A little background information on this bill before I took it, turn it over. The actual number of child victims of sexual abuse is unknown because so many do not report their abuse. In addition, many adult survivors of child sexual abuse never disclose their abuse to anyone. We all remember the news stories of the USA gymnastics team doctor who abused the children in his care for many years. As his at his trial, former gymnasts, many in their 30s, reported about the abuse 20 years or more after it occurred. Child sexual abuse and exploitation is a crime that is preserved in silence and in secrecy. Child victims often do not discover the relationship of their psychological injuries to the abuse until well into adulthood, usually during psychological counseling or therapy. They may not even discover the fact of such abuse until they undergo such therapy. This delay often protects the abusers and those that aid them from facing full accountability for their actions. According to the National Center for Victims of Crime, nearly every state has a basic suspension of the statute of limitation for civil actions while a person is a minor. Many states also have adopted additional extensions specifically for cases involving sexual abuse of children. Extensions for filing civil actions for child sexual abuse are most often based upon the discovery rule. By the time the victim discovers the sexual abuse or the relationship of the conduct of the injuries, the ordinary time limitation may have expired. As I noted before, this delayed discovery may be due to emotional and psychological trauma and is often accompanied by repression of the memory of abuse. Many states have extended their statutes of limitations for civil actions involving these cases and some states have removed this limitation entirely. Now I would like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Brazier and um, she will walk you through the bill. Good morning, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Allison Brazier. I'm here on behalf of Nevada Justice Association and I'm honored to present this bill with Senator Dondero Lee. Um, just before I get into the bill, I wanna talk about the intent of the bill. I mean, the intent of the bill is really to stop human trafficking and sex abuse and exploitation of children in Nevada. This bill deals specifically with victims who are under the age of 18. Um, and to give you an idea of the scope of the problem, at least as far as we know and have been reported, which we know will be under reporting, according to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, um, between 2007 and 2016, there were 1,500 calls of sus suspected human trafficking in Nevada alone. That's on average a little more than three calls per week for nine years just in Nevada. Um, and of the cases that were actually open based on those calls, um, there were almost 500 cases opened in Las Vegas, which puts us number six in the nation. And there were 51 cases opened in Reno, which puts them number 64 in the nation. So clearly um, having about one case opened per week over the course of nine years shows We've got a big problem in Nevada, and we hope that this bill will address um, that problem and hopefully reduce those numbers. Um, we know the origin of the problems involving um, child sex trafficking and abuse are the pimps and the abusers um, and the traffickers, but we also know that those people don't work alone. They rely on businesses who turn a blind eye and let this type of abuse occur on their property. Um, so the intent of this bill is to financially punish those bad actors, businesses, and other co-conspirators who turn a blind eye and allow crimes against children to occur on their property or with their knowledge. Um, so with that, I wanna walk you through the bill, um, just some of the highlights. Uh, section two of the bill um, creates financial liability for persons or businesses who knowingly benefit um, from activities which they knew or should have known 
um, were aiding and facilitating in sexual abuse or exploitation of children. Um, just to be clear and for the record, um, the language that we have in section two, subsection two that I was just referencing uh, mirrors exactly language from the Federal Traffic Victims Protection Act. So this is nothing new. We're just taking what's already um, existing in federal law and codifying it here in Nevada. Um, subsection four of section two, um, which is, is addressed in the amendment, um, attempts, attempts to create some parameters and definitions around what um, is meant by that term financial benefit. Um, and uh, for that purpose, it defines that any hotel or motel or other establishment with more than 175 rooms uh, merely renting a room is not enough to meet this financial benefit requirement. Um, there wasn't any magic formula or equation that we used to get to that 175 room uh, benchmark, um, but with working um, and having conversations with gaming and the chamber about how do we how do we create something that's uh, practical and equitable uh, that would apply, you know, because this bill applies to small motels that have, you know, might have 10 or 20 rooms, but it also is going to apply to big strip properties that might have thousands of rooms and employees. Um, and so in working with them, uh, we came up with um, the 175 room um, benchmark, uh, which we felt was appropriate at this point, um, you know, just because the level of knowledge and participation is going to vary depending on the size of the establishment. Um, so we hope that um, it's clear by the just the language of the bill, but also, um, you know, in the testimony that we've provided that um, the intent of the bill is not to open the floodgates to lawsuits and create kind of unlimited liability for businesses. Um, section two of the bill outlines very specific circumstances and requirements that must be met um, and that the victim would have to show um, that the, the business was turning a blind eye and letting the abuse occur before then um, any financial liability would be imposed. Um, and then the other part I wanted to just go through quickly is section one of the bill that's also addressed in the amendment. Um, subsection two, well actually all of section one and the amendment was uh, just to kind of clean up some language around the timing of these suits. The so subsection two, um, would allow victims to bring suit anytime after the abuse occurred. So they wouldn't have to wait until they're 18. They could bring it at any point in time um, after the abuse occurs. And then subsection three of section one um, establishes a clear 20 year statute of limitations after the victim turns 18. Um, the original intent of the bill and the original drafting of the bill completely eliminated the statute of limitations. Um, and that's uh, that was our goal. Um, but after hearing concerns from various stakeholders um, about uh, some of the uncertainty and the uh, burden that they felt that that would impose upon businesses, um, we reached the compromise position of 20 years uh, for the statute of limitations. Um, so that's that's essentially the highlights of the bill. Um, so I just want to conclude um, in saying that in some um, this, the intent of this bill is to protect children in Nevada. It targets pimps, abusers, and other bad actors who turn a blind eye and who facilitate and aid and abed in sexual abuse and exploitation of children in Nevada. And um, this bill, by creating a financial liability to those people and those businesses, will help us put the back, bad actors out of business and um, hopefully have an impact on the human trafficking and sex abuse of children occurring in Nevada. Um, and with that, I'll look into any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Dondero Loop. Good to see you and thank you, Ms. Brazier. Committee members, do we have questions on Senate Bill 203? Assemblyman Orrant Licker. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for bringing the bill. David Orantlicker from Assembly District 20. Um, I'm just so curious about this connection between knowing about the abuse that's going on and the size of your establishment. Because Section 3 requires that the proprietor know or should know what's going on. And that doesn't seem related to whether they're 
150 rooms or 200 rooms. So if the large proprietor knows what's going on, why do we give them an exemption? Um, Allison Brazier, for the record, um, there isn't an exemption. Um, I think what the um, what subsection four does is just say that merely renting a room isn't enough to show that there was knowledge or that you were gaining some type of benefit. And again, the reason uh, there was no, you know, there's probably is no right magic number for the num the establishing the number of rooms as a benchmark. Um, but uh, some of the concerns expressed by um, gaming um, and some of the other stakeholders was that, you know, if you had a property that has thousands of employees, you know, at what point does the knowledge get imputed to the business owner? And so, you know, we, we believe that, um, you know, truck stops or small motels or maybe, um, you know, other establishments um, that are much smaller um, where they may only have a handful of employees or, you know, 10 or 20 rooms. And um, it would be almost impossible not to know what was happening, um, that, that there was a difference between those type of establishments and bigger strip properties where you might have thousands of employees. So I guess, you know, just to get back to your original question, there is no exemption created for these larger establishments. It's just that we've created, um, uh, I guess, a higher standard um, to, to prove cases against them. Okay, so that, um, I'm not sure that I follow that. So if you could, let's say you have the 200 room establishment and they know that what's going on, what benefit, but you can't um, go after them because they benefited from the room, income from the room. So what benefit do you have to show for them if you can't show that they benefited by renting the room? Um, Allison Brazier, for the record, you know, I don't, I guess there would be maybe different permeations of it, but if there was, you know, maybe some uh, kickbacks that were being paid or, or cash that was being paid on top of just merely the room rental that you would uh, be able to show um, something above just merely renting the room. So again, you know, the scenarios I'm thinking of or are, are you know, um, someone giving a uh, you know, an employee, maybe cash um, per, you know, room that's being rented or, um, you know, John that might be let up into a room, you know, throughout the day, something where it's, it's above and beyond just merely renting the room. And again, you know, I, I, there's probably different permeations of it, but what I'm thinking of is just those kickbacks or tips or, um, know, a bribe, if you want to call it, that's that's given uh, above and beyond just the room rental. Go next to Assemblywoman Krasner. Thank you, Chair Yeager. Senator uh, Don Darrelloop, thank you so much for bringing this bill. Uh, I, I love the bill. Um, a little bit of background, my very first session in 2017, uh, I brought AB 145 with Irene Bustamante Adams, and that created the current law for child victims of sexual abuse, giving them 20 years from the times they turn, they turn 18. And, and I, I know this is such an important issue, and so many child victims don't ever tell anyone, and uh, especially the example you gave about the USA Girls Gymnastics team, the coaches were abusing those girls as well as the doctor. Uh, so I want to thank you for bringing the bill and ask if you might please accept me as a co-sponsor. Thank you, Assemblywoman. We'd be happy to have you as a co-sponsor. Thank you very much. Do we have additional questions from committee members? Okay, I'm looking over to my right. I don't see any questions. I'm looking over to my left. I see Assemblywoman Hanson. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being here and for presenting the bill. I, I should probably have not asked to say something. I share the same concerns. I, I appreciate the bill, and, and I, 
I, I think I'm having the same issues that my colleague, um, Assemblyman uh, Ornlicker, is having. I'm not understanding, other than I understand for you to get this bill to go forward, you probably need to go to a, a room limit um, with the resorts um, not kind of having a carve out in my mind. And for me, you know, when we talk about sex trafficking, I don't think it's just occurring, and I'm sure you have the research to show that it 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 it, it occurs in all kinds of venues, high end, low end, and the higher end have video cameras. They have the surveillance that the smaller motels, the lower room numbers we're talking about. So I, I certainly appreciate this bill. I'm just not comfortable that we're carving out the bigger players that I think maybe are maybe not knowingly involved, but it is going on. And I, I would hope that, um, yes, I understand there's a lot of employees. There's a lot of things that go on that management might know about, but I'm concerned about the carve out, but thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you, Allison Brazier, for the record. Um, the original draft of the bill you know, didn't have uh, any type of threshold for um, room, um, room numbers. And so you're correct. It's a, it's a compromise amendment um, to, I guess, alleviate or address some concerns that were expressed in the original draft. Thank you, and, and I appreciate the position you're in. Thank you so much. Do we have additional questions from committee members? Okay, I don't see additional questions. So, uh, Senator, thank you for presenting. Ms. Brazier, thank you for presenting as well. We'll have you sit tight for just a moment. We'll take some testimony, and then we'll come back for concluding remarks. So at this time, I'm going to open up for testimony in support of Senate Bill 203. Is there anybody here in Carson City who would like to testify in support? Looks like we've lost most of our audience here. I don't see anyone coming forward. I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom either. BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there's anybody there in support, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 203, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. We will begin with caller with the last three digits of 540. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Yeager, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Serena Evans, S-E-R-E-N-A-E-V-A-N-S, and I'm the policy specialist for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. Just keeping it brief and saying that we are in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Evans. BPS, do we have additional callers in support? Next caller with the last three digits of 207, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. You may begin. Thank you, your Chairman Yeager. Thank you, Chairman Yeager and committee members for allowing me to testify in support of Senate Bill 203. My name is Catherine Robb, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N-R-O-B-B. And I'm the executive director of Child U.S. Advocacy, and I am also a survivor of child sexual abuse. At Child U.S. Advocacy, we work on child protection legislation all over the country. There is clearly a national trend by lawmakers in responding to this epidemic of child sexual abuse, which the data uh, sadly shows that one in five girls and one in 13 boys will be sexually assaulted before their 18th birthday. That's 13.5% of all children. And thanks to the science of traumatology, we also know that the average age a victim discloses this abuse is age 52. I was in my mid forties. Since 2002, 38 states, the federal government and the District of, District of Columbia have extended their statute of limitations for child sexual abuse and 22 jurisdictions have revived their civil statute of limitations. 13 jurisdictions have completely eliminated the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse. This year, 30 states have already introduced SOL reform bills, 17 are revivals. 
This Monday, Arkansas passed a two-year window and an extension to age 55. So the national trend is clear. The sky hasn't fallen. Some will cry, well, the courts will be flooded. The courts have not been flooded. Some will also cry, well, we don't do this for other torts. These are not car crashes or slip and fall cases. We're talking about the rape and sexual assault of children. These are very different civil wrongs that silence their victims. Some will also cry institutions will go bankrupt. Well, bankruptcies are Chapter 11. They're voluntary. They serve the wrongdoer. It's a new day for them, but not for the victim. Victims become a number on a spreadsheet. Their voice is lost, and the wrongs of others are kept secret as there's no discovery. Finally, some will cry, it's not fair. How about, a bit, how about due process? As an attorney and as an American, I believe in due process, but constitutional rights are not absolute. The safety and the common good often outweigh due process. Moreover, there are safeguards. Rules of civil procedure, rules of evidence remain in place, and plaintiffs must still prove their cases. Again, these are not car crashes, not slip and fall cases. We're talking about the rape of children. Public policy demands a different response for a very different, horrific, and repeated wrong to children. I do hope Nevada can follow the national trend to protect children and to hold those who harm children accountable. I'm happy to offer any more testimony on delayed disclosure or the science of traumatology or legally what's going on across the country, and I thank you. Thank you for your testimony and support, Ms. Robb. BPS, are there additional callers in support on the line? Chair, there are no other callers in support at this time. Thank you, BPS. I'll close testimony in support. I will now open it up for testimony in opposition. Is there anybody here in Carson City in opposition? I don't see anyone coming forward. I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom in opposition. BPS, could we check the phones to see if there's anybody in opposition, please? For callers wishing to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 203, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Callers wishing to provide testimony in opposition of Senate Bill 203, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition. Thank you, BPS. I'll close testimony in opposition. I will now open it up for testimony in the neutral position, and we'll start here in Carson City. Please come forward. And Senator, we'll have to ask you to vacate the table for just a moment as we have a testifier here, and we only have one chair at the table. Thank you. Welcome, and please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Misty Grimmer with the Nevada Resort Association. We are um, in neutral on the bill. Uh, this bill is one of those that has taken a lot of uh, compromise and a lot of conversations to come to a good uh, piece of policy that on it's such an important issue. I did want to also put on the record that the Resort Association does have a monthly working group for the properties to come together and address the, the, uh, the issue of human trafficking and what we can do to prevent it and the types of training that our employees can get so that they do recognize it when it, if, if, it, if it does ever happen to, to land in our properties. However, in our conversations with the sponsors, they have told us that they don't think this is actually happening in our properties. It's happening in more less desirable places, I'll just put it that way. So, but we are in neutral and really appreciate the work that the sponsor and the advocates have done on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grimmer. And before you leave, we do have a question for you from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Chair Yeager, Chandra Summers Armstrong, Assembly District 6, for the record. Ms. Grimmer, can you describe whether, or can you confirm whether or not the training that the staff um, you said that there's training uh, for staff. Is this across all of them, the major um, uh, hotel chains? Is it a consistent, uh, is it a, a, 
a standard prescribed training, and does that training include um, a requirement to report? And if so, what does that look like? Thank you. Ms. T. Grimmer, for the record, representing the Nevada Resort Association. Um, I can definitely get back to the committee with a lot more details. Um, like I said, it is a, it is a, a, a statewide and multiple properties working group that come together um, and, and come up with the best practices. So I, right this moment, I don't have the specific details, but I will certainly get those back to the committee. Thank you, Ms. Grimmer. Appreciate your testimony. Is there anybody else here in Carson City in the neutral position? I don't see anyone coming forward. Let me take a look at the Zoom. Again, I don't see anybody there. BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there's any neutral testimony on the phone, please? Thank you. For callers wishing to testify in neutral of Senate Bill 203, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. We will begin with caller with the last three digits of 124. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Yeager and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, M-O-R, A-D, K-H-A-N. I am the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber originally had concerns with SB 203 as introduced because the overall broadness of the language, the bill, and the potential impact it would have on employers and landlords. We had made a commitment in, to work with the proponents of the bill to find an equitable solution. I'd like to thank the bill sponsor and the proponents of the bill for working with members of the business community in order to address our concerns while maintaining the tentative bill through the amendment process. I believe we have achieved that goal and the chamber is now neutral on SB 203. Thank you, Chair Yeager and members of the committee for your time this morning. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Moradkin. BPS, are there additional callers in the neutral position? Here, there are no other callers in neutral at this time. Thank you, BPS. I will close neutral testimony. I will now invite Senator Don Darrell Loop back up to the table. We'll give you a chance to make any concluding remarks, and then we'll allow Ms. Brazier to do the same. So please go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Chair Yeager. To conclude, I would just say that the change in our statutes is long overdue. The survivors of child sex abuse and exploitation deserve a civil forum to pursue their abusers and those who benefited from the abuse or exploitation. The treble damages in the bill are intended to be punitive as a deterrent to those who aid and abet or turn a blind eye to the abuse or exploitation. I thank you for your time today, um, committee members and Chair Yeager, and I urge your support of the bill. Thank you, Senator Don Darrell Loop. Ms. Brazier, any concluding remarks? Um, nothing other than what Senator Don Darrell Loop has said, and just wanted to thank uh, you, Chair, and the committee for hearing this. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for your patience this morning as we got through the other bills on the agenda. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. I will now close the hearing on Senate Bill 203. That takes us to our last item on the agenda, which is public comment. By way of a reminder, we reserve up to 30 minutes at the end of each meeting for public comment. Public commenters will have two minutes to provide public comment. Public comment is a time to raise matters of a general nature within the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. Let's start here in Carson City. Mr. Pirro, any public comment this morning? Mr. Pirro is with us. He's the only one with us at this point. He does not have public comment. BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if anyone there would like to give public comment? For callers wishing to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. We will begin with the caller with the last three digits of 653. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chairman Yeager and the esteemed uh, Committee of Assembly Judiciary. My name is Dora Martinez. I represent the Nevada Disability Action Coalition. Um, Chairman, I wanted to call in support of the Bill uh, 203, but I was in a noisy place. Um, I just want to ditto 
um, the people that were calling in in support for the record. Um, thank you. And also, today is National um, International Guide Dog Day, and I was in a donut place getting a my Sarge service dog a donut. So thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you for your public comment, Ms. Martinez. And, of course, now I'm craving a donut, so thank you for that. Uh, VPS, could we take the next uh, person for public comment, please? Caller with the last three digits of 556, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Ian Marie Grant, A-N-N-E-M-A-R-I-E-G-R-A-N-T, Sister of Thomas Purdy, murdered by Reno Police and Marshall County Sheriff's Office. Today I'd like to talk about two people who died on this date. They were killed by police in Nevada. Jose Luis Dominguez was 47-year-old. When he was shot and killed by Sparks police officers, Ryan Patterson, Corey Foster, and Scott Bader two years ago today. In DA Chris Hicks' typical MO, he did not release his usual justification of the shooting until 8-21-2020. Those who knew Jose loved him and were blessed with his generous spirit. He loved deeply and family was of the utmost importance to him. He enjoyed cooking, working around his home, playing horseshoes, and watching his 49ers and Giants play. Russia County Sheriff's Office took the lead on the independent investigation. They are the same agency along with Reno PD who asphyxiated my mentally ill brother in crisis. Police investigating police is not transparency and accountability. 15 years ago today, 36-year-old Aaron Jones was killed by LVMPD after being confronted by officers near Sahara Avenue and Durango Drive, he allegedly tried to ram a police car and started driving towards officers. Officers shot Aaron. At the coroner's inquest, questions were raised about whether officers were truly in danger when they fired the weapons. Armored vehicles, hollow point bullets, rubber bullets, CS gas, helicopters, stab vests, tactical robots, de-escalation training, CIP training, we have given it all to police, and they are still killing community members. Please support bills that promote transparency and accountability. If law enforcement opposes a bill, I ask that you support it. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment, Ms. Grant. Is there anybody else for public comment on the line, BPS? Chair, there are no other callers for public comment. Thank you, BPS. I will now close public comment. Anything else from hardworking committee members this morning before we talk about the rest of the week? All right, I don't see anything. So again, reminder, we have a meeting tomorrow at 9 o'clock, not 8 o'clock. You can get here at 8, but you don't have to be here that early. So we'll do two bills tomorrow at 9 o'clock. We don't have a Judiciary Committee meeting scheduled for Friday, and I'll give you an update tomorrow on what next week is going to look like. I just have some, have some more information for you then. So hope everyone has a great rest of the day. We will see you back in this committee room tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. This meeting is adjourned.